our liturgical season of Advent that began last week. This is the second Sunday of Advent. And Pastor Mike was explaining last week that if Advent begins with the liturgical calendar or the worship calendar worldwide for um, many believers and Christians um, across the world, and it is a it is a moment of, of new beginning. It is a time where we can reset the button. So if you weren't here last week, he preached unwrapping the gift part one, and he talked about waking up. Right? Waking up to things that have made us fall into sleep or, and, and then waking up to things um, that we need to start acknowledging. And so we're going to continue talking about what it means to, to begin anew and to have new things. So I'm not coming from a lectionary text this morning, but it is an additive text. It's found in the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets by the name of Micah. So if you turn to the book of Micah, if you are... In the Bible that the church has, it's 756, page 756. Micah is considered a minor prophet, not because of his particular work, but because of the length of the books. So how long the writings were determined whether it was considered a major prophet or a minor prophet in terms of the Bible. So if you're turning in Micah, we're going to go to chapter 5. Two verses, verses two and three. <coughs> Micah chapter five, verses two and three. Reads as follows. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth from the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Say thanks be to God. We're going to talk a little bit about birth. About birth. Let's bow forward in prayer. God, we ask in this moment that as we prepare to hear and receive your word, that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit will make our ears ready for the sound. That you make us very sensitive to your voice and to your promptings, such that as your word reaches our spirit and our souls and our hearts, that it will take root and it will grow. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Michael was written during a time when um, Israel was split into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Okay, So there was um, Judah and there was Israel. And both kingdoms had been overtaken. So all of the children of Israel at the time that this book is written are in exile. So they really need a word of hope. So that's what this message from Micah is. He is proclaiming that out of Bethlehem, this really small town, the Savior will come. The ruler of Israel will come. He is predicting the birth of Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus comes. Have you ever had something promised to you, but you have to wait a very long time? <laughs> so he's giving them a message of hope, and he's saying to them that God's promises never expire. Even though there are times in our lives when it feels like they do. All right. And so what he's talking about here is he's talking about Mary giving birth and being in labor with Jesus. Okay. And we've heard it at Christmas time over and over again. This story of the Virgin Mary who um, gives birth to Jesus and travels to Bethlehem. And, you know, there's no room for her in the end. But if we really take a peek into this birthing process, what it means to be pregnant and then to give birth, we can start to see some similarities in how God has created how this birthing, this physical birthing process can also mirror a spiritual birth. Some things that God is doing in us that's sometimes new, that's fresh. Um, and so if we peek into Mary's life, or anyone who's been physically pregnant, any women among us, you know, it could have been easy. Even the best of pregnancies are very filled with discomfort, to say the 
the very least. Your body is changing every day. You have no control over that. You're getting bigger and bigger. And the whole idea is that you want to get bigger. Like, if you're not getting bigger, something's wrong, but you're still getting bigger. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so all of these changes are happening. And I can only imagine her hormones are going crazy. Joseph just can't seem to write, say the right thing. You know, one moment she's crying, the next she's angry, then she's happy. And she still has to go about all her daily tasks. She still has to do everything that she's responsible for. Her ankles are swelling. She's retaining fluid, right? Her back is hurting, you know? In the early months, I'm sure she was probably nauseous, even if she didn't ever get sick. She never got sick. But <clears throat> there's this process to even being pregnant for nine. Some people say 10. I'm probably one of those people saying it's close to 10 months. I feel like 10 months. <laughs> Of, of preparing to give birth to this child, this new life. And so there is this process that is oftentimes not easy. It is a process that is difficult, that is often uncomfortable. And what does that look like for us as God is saying to us during this Advent season, I'm resetting the button, this is a new beginning. What does it say for God to be birthing something new in us and what is required of us in that? So that's what we're going to deal with today for just a few minutes. I would say that if we want God to do something new in us, to bring forth something new spiritually, emotionally, then the first thing we have to be willing to do is to be humble. We must first be willing to be humble. We look in this passage, it says, Oh, Bethlehem, who are one of the little clans of Judah? Little clans. You know, that, that's meant literally. Bethlehem was a very humble place. They were not significant in size nor influence. Right? It's like comparing my hometown, Yanceville, to L.A. There's, you know, there's no real comparison. Like, what? Jesus is going to be born in Yanceville. Where is that? <laughs> the king, The king of, of Israel, our Savior, is born in Yanceville. That's what it sounded like for him to be born in Bethlehem. It was a very humble place. But we know that God's estimations of value and worth are not the same as ours. Come on now. And so if we are wanting to be in a place where God is going to do something new, God is going to do something great, we have to understand that God often does great things in those who are humble. All right. Right? Humility. Now this is a difficult thing for us. It's hard. I mean, we're not living in a humble society. <clears throat> Everything's oversized, right? When we dream about stuff, we don't dream about humble things. <laughs> Whose dream car is a 83 Pinto just broke down. No one dreams, no one says that's my dream car, I want a Pinto. Right? No, we have all these lavish dreams of what it means to have the greatest of things. But God says greatness for God comes through humility. All right. We have to be humble. When I was going back and forth to Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina, <clears throat> there was one occasion where I entered this house with one of my spiritual mothers and it was a family living there. It was a duplex and they didn't have any carpet on the floor. It was concrete floors. It was dead of winter. Um, it was really damp in there. They had mold, dark black mold on all the walls. They didn't have electricity. And because there was mold on the walls, the girls had to wear their coats all day long because the mother would have to open the windows in order to allow ventilation to come through so her girls wouldn't get sick. They slept on a, on a damp mattress that was directly on the cement floor. And there was one little girl, one of her daughters was named Nora Saw. I will never forget her name. Her name was Nora Saw, and she and I spent a little time together. She had a few things in her possession that, that belonged to her, only a pen for the And so as the grown people were talking, you know, I'm hanging out with the kids, children. Because I'm, you know, I'm drawn to kids. And so, when it's time for us to go, Norsa says, Don, I want you to wait a minute. She speaks to her mom, her mom nods. She goes back into her room and she brings out her teddy bear, one of two toys that she has. And she hands it to me and she says, Donna, I want you to have it. And I was humbled tremendously in that moment. 
Why? Because here's this little girl who is willing to do in her limitation what I wasn't probably willing to do in my abundance. One of the few things that she had, one of her most prized things, she was willing to give away because of an act of kindness she felt like I had given to her. And here I was, and God spoke very clearly to me in that moment. He was like, darling, you think you're doing a good thing down here, right? I'm coming to do some good. I'm coming to help you, right? I'm pouring brownie things. But in that moment, God was like, no, I need you to humble yourself. I want you to see my face in her. And I saw the face of Jesus on the face of that child. And something shifted in me because of that humbling experience. There was a place in which I realized I saw my own stuff. And I said, oh my goodness. And being in a humble place changed even the way I prayed for the rest of that trip. Amen. It changed what I was able to see and what God was able to show me. Stuff that was already there, but because of my own pride and arrogance and thinking, oh, I'm doing this great thing. Right? Right? I could not see. God needed me to be humble just so he could begin to show me the stuff that I refused to see before because I thought I already had it. Good word, good word. And here he uses this girl who I'm coming to help to help me. <laughs> if we want God to do something new, yes. something great, and greatness for God is not greatness as we understand it. All right, praise God. And we've got to be willing to be humble. Yes. <laughs> because why? God honors humility. Mm -hmm. So you got to be willing to be humble. Number two. Second thing you got to be willing to do <coughs> is you have to be willing to be made pure, to be cleansed. We go back to the passage. We see it says, when she who is in labor has brought forth. She refers to the Virgin Mary. Virgin means pure. It means untainted, undefiled. Now this doesn't mean that we're perfect. Right? Purity doesn't mean that we're perfect. I mean, if that's the case, there's no need to try and see purity. <laughs> We'd all just, you know, say, hey, I give up before I try. But it does mean this active movement towards what it means to be clean and right with God. All right? right? Now we, again, go back to this birthing process. When women are about to give labor, and I know you've seen it on the movies, and they, you know, they're somewhere outside of a hospital, you know, like Ronna used to always do it, right? My grandma had one of her nine kids in a, in a, in a, in a hospital. But what's the first thing they do? They say, boil water. And a lot of people watch that, and they say, oh, why are you boiling water? You just boil the water just to boil water? No, you boil the water to sterilize all of the stuff. Right? Why? Because you don't want an infection to cause harm to the lives that you're dealing with. Yes. Right? God is not going to birth something new in you or through you if it's got to come through fill to get out. Right? It's going to taint it. It's going to compromise the new life that God is trying to bring. Great preacher. Now, unfortunately, though, we like to talk a lot about repentance, but we don't actually like to do it. Well. Yeah. And what is repentance? Well, we've heard it over and over again, but you know, for the sake of this sermon, we'll say it again. All right? Repentance is, I admit, God, that I have caused you pain by something I've done or by something that's present in my life. And I am willing, because we can't always put stuff aside on our own. That's why we need to praise God. I am willing to submit to you and turn towards your grace. Yes. And away from that thing so that you can pull me further away from it. Repentance is I admit it. Right? Step number one. Step number two, I turn towards you and away from it. Right. The problem is we don't often do that. And it becomes really easy to, to cover our sin and our filth, you know, with great perfume and oil. You ever been around somebody who you know they need to take a bath? And they didn't take a bath. They just put more deodorant on them. Or they spray some perfume. Just put them. I know it's bad. <laughs> right? But we've all done that spiritually. We have all done that spiritually. And what do we do? We cover it with, with very spiritual phrases. Well, God is not through with me yet. Right? 
Oh, we have all seen and fallen short of the glory of God. <laughs> all of those things are true. Don't get me wrong. But they do not take the place of repentance. Yes, all right, all right. And when you start saying those things about yourself, like that's usually stuff we say to other people to, to help them give themselves grace. When people can't seem to forgive themselves, you say, well, look, we're all in that same boat. You know? But when you start saying it about yourself, folks well, calling yourself out, and look, look, we all see. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> with Jesus' words. It's not the right use. But what's even more dangerous is when our stuff doesn't stink quite as bad. It's not as overt as other people's. We can hide it real nice. Right? Yeah. That's more dangerous. Why? Because it's harder for people to see it and hold you accountable for it. Good word. Now, I told 9 o'clock that, you know, this example is the best example I can give, but it humbles me because it's not what I like to share. But when I was a kid, I didn't like to take baths. I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't like to take the time. I felt like it was a waste of time. Anytime I didn't have to, I did right? So I'm not like that no more, no more. Glory, glory. Amen, glory. We were on vacation as a family. You know, you 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 share the room with your parents, and I have one sister, and so you got two queen beds, right? It's a double room. Mom and dad in one bed, me and my sister in one bed. We had gone to the beach out all day. You know, I didn't really sweat. You know, I didn't sink, right? My sister gets into the shower. She gets out, and she's watching me. Like, she's just standing there watching me like, ah! <laughs> right? I'm taking off my clothes. I'm grabbing my pajamas. I know this girl ain't about to get in the bed with me dirty. She said, God. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you gonna take a bath? I said, no, I ain't dirty. I said, I'm sleeping. She said, you what? I said, I'm not dirty. She didn't say anything else. She walked into the bathroom. She got to wipe the towel. She ran in the water. She came back. She wiped it down my leg. And she said, you see that dirt? She said, you dirt. <laughs> <laughs> But seeing that dirt on that white paper towel, yeah. dirt that was not visible to my eye when I looked at my bed, right. I, I promise you it changed me for life. Like to this day, I do not go to bed without taking a bath. <laughs> That's why we have road rage. 
That's why when you stuck, you know, in traffic, you biting yourself because you took the highway rather than taking the back road. You get into the grocery store, you in a rush, you got two items, there are four lines, all of them got people in, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> right? Only to stand in this line, and that line that you were originally in goes all the way through, and you biting yourself, upset in the line because you didn't stay in that line. <laughs> right? This concept of controlling time, when the elevators were first created, Shame. 10 second delay. People complain about the 10 second delay when the doors were closed when elevators were first created. Engineers got so tired of it that what did they do? They put in a closed door button. Now it may have changed now, but originally when they put in that closed door button, it didn't change the 10 second delay. But people stopped complaining because they felt like they had control over pushing that button. Come on now. something new. And it's not just about why go back to the passage. 
The last part of verse 3 says, When she who is in labor has brought forth, then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. Don't you know that when God blesses you, someone else is always, always blessed by that story. Right, the stuff that you go through, the processes that you go through to get to where God wants you to be at, always yields a return for someone else in your life. Amen. So no process is just about you. No struggle, no difficulty, no birthing and impregnation is just about you. Because you don't go through this life by yourself. What would it mean for God to say, just, just press through this process, press through this process, and, and, and your, your mother and your father, they'll, they'll put the bottle down by what I birthed in. What would it mean for someone to see you going through this process and changing so radically that they say, I, I want to come home? Because you can't go through a process that brings forth birth and not change. Archaeologists can look at the remains of a woman's body, her bones, and tell whether or not she gave birth to a child. If you go through this kind of process, and this process isn't just once, God is constantly birthing things in us, right? Yeah. But after every birth, you will never be the same again. <laughs> and sometimes never being the same again is what is the testimony to someone else that if you can go through that and come out like that, oh, no. <laughs> I want what you got. I know who you are. I saw you back in the day. Right. Jesus changed you. Oh, where can I get Jesus? God. And this is where the hope of God lies. Yeah. This is how God works in concert with us. Where we're saying, God, I'm trusting you that through this process, because we all going to struggle whether we with Jesus or not. Amen. Amen. Through this process, God, I know that you're birthing something in me, and I am making a commitment. And it is a commitment because after that thing is birthed, after that gift comes forth, you got to nurture it, and you got to grow it for the rest of your life. Say that. Say that. you got to pray over it. You gotta give to it. That's what we do for babies. Right? And so you're making this commitment, and God is saying, You will be the hope that I need to somebody else. You will be the joy that somebody else is able to encounter. Your story will be what brings somebody else peace. Glory, glory. And that's the beauty of how God works this thing. This is the beauty of how God does this thing. So we're in the season of Advent and we're saying, God, do something new. Why? Because we want our families to change. We want our communities to change. We want our sons and daughters off the streets. But if we aren't willing to do the work, if we aren't willing to go through the process, how many people could we be holding up because of that? How many times are we passing people and we have a story and there's an encounter, but because we have been stalling the process, yeah. it takes that much longer because I still believe the grace of God is there. So this is where we are today at Advent. This is where we are with this new beginning. And so the question becomes, we know that God wants to give us new birth. We know that God wants to give us new birth. We know God wants to take us to new and higher places. God wants to give us greatness in the way God understands. But at what point are we going to stop?